Hello and welcome to Hayes Building Futures Career Conversations with Leading Lights Across the Built Environment. Today I have Neetu Kostler, who is Social Inclusion Manager and Multicultural Chair for Amy. Hello. Hi. So I met you last year. We were at a DI event and we have cross paths. And I immediately, having listened to you, felt a connection. And I thought, this is a lady who I need to listen to because I am going to learn from her. I really felt that. And we bumped into each other again earlier this year. And I am really grateful that you've agreed to come and talk about yourself and your career. So can you just explain, because obviously I've got to know you over time. Can you explain to everybody who doesn't know you about your role at the moment? Um, so we'll swing back, but... Currently, I am the social value manager in the group function for Amy. Um, for those of you who don't know what Amy does, um, I like to say that Amy is in everything, on, our, on your roads, in your hospitals, aviation, um, highways, you name it, we design it and build it. Um, and also a couple of years ago, took over the role as multicultural chair for our affinity groups as well. Wonderful. So what I'm always interested in when I talk to people about their careers and a lot of people who listen to this are very fascinated by it. How did you get into the construction industry? Was it something you knew you wanted to do from an early age or is it something that actually just chance and life you ended up working for uh, in the cross built environments? Um, I fell into it. <laughs> I um, actually started about eight years ago at Amy and I, I want to say it was my real career break. Right. If I, you yeah. know, I didn't really know what construction was, track was, any of that. Um, I had quite a different work journey, I actually really wanted to be a dentist. So I was a dental nurse for five years while I was studying and um, all my family are sort of doctors, dentists, whatever. Um, and then I, I got married very, very young, semi-arranged marriage at 20, and then wasn't really um, given the opportunity to further my education. So did did know that I wanted a career of some sort and uh, started my first administration job at Sony PlayStation at 18 and um, kind of continued from there and building up the skills along the way. I had a few good jobs and that was it really. And then eight years ago, I found myself at Amy. So how, do, how did you go? Did you always know that you wanted to be involved in social inclusion? Has that, or was it something that kind of organically happened and the opportunity came up? This happened after COVID. Right. And um, I was the executive assistant to the managing director for consulting and rail. Wow. Okay. So learned very quickly on my feet. <laughs> And she's a she was a lady, and in fact, um, a woman in this industry who's been in it for like twenty years. She has seen some stuff, yeah. and she'd always get called the ice queen. Um, I'd like to say she's a very very good friend of mine now, and even now. But I learned a lot from her, and mm -hmm. she gave me my break. Um, COVID happened, and then we came back and. And Nicholas actually left now, so it was I was the EA to the consulting side of the business, mm. and everybody kept talking about DNI around that table, and social value and communities, and these are my communities, mm. and they are very complicated and complex, and I could see everyone making these decisions, and I'm thinking, well, that's not going to work, so I started sort of challenging. And I was never very good at challenging. I am from a marginalized community. We um, are brought up to go, yes, sir, no, sir. Your boss is your God. Right. Um, and that's the culture. And I started pushing back and started challenging. 
And actually, the MD now, who's Alex, um, gave me my role as social value manager and said, look, if you want to do this, go and do it, go and, go and do it well. Um, so that's how I started. And then I left consulting more recently to come into groups so I could sort of go across the business, start educating people about the very complicated communities that everyone's trying to go into. So... We know across the built environment, we've got the biggest challenges. We've got to continue to build people's homes and schools and hospitals and all the things, roads from A to B, as you described, mm -hmm. to bring communities together and to physically build communities. At the same time, one of the biggest social challenges we have is to fix net carbon zero and to, to make this world survive. In order to do that, we need everyone to feel included and feel part of the solution in the built environment. And yet, as you described, not necessarily everyone feels part of that. So if somebody listening to this is part of an organisation that wants more people to feel that they belong, what advice would you give to say, this is what you can do to engage more people and, and make people from any diverse background feel included? So I think what we're tr all trying to do in this industry is to try to go to people furthest away from the labour market and give them a chance. Yeah. Um, I would class people from my communities in that community, in the working class community, because they're all living together. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're white, black, brown, whatever. Um, the problem you have with especially in rail and highways, everyone's the same around those tables. No one's really embracing difference or doing anything differently. And we've been talking the talk for about three years now. We're not walking the walk. I do not see the results at the moment. Um, and our communities need to see trajectory. They need to see people in senior positions so they know that they've got a route, they, route, they've got a pathway, they've got a development plan. And more recently, the way I've been trying to educate bidding and work winning is if you are going to go into these communities, if you are trying to create positivity and unity, you can't just go in. You have got to take the relatable people with you. You have got to take the people who speak the language. They are not going to listen to an English woman and an English man doing a challenge cup or doing something in a school or whatever. They're going to go back to the same home life. They can't educate their parents. So when you take someone who's relatable, when you take someone who can sensitively talk to the mums, the dads, the brothers, they're a big problem, um, and explain to them, actually, look at what we're doing. We're doing all of this to change the industry. Yeah. We can't do it without you. So we can help with that and we can work as allies together. And I think there's a lot of um, um, possibly pushback where people are a little bit worried to yes. say the wrong thing yeah. or to tread on people's toes. And the, the multicultural, marginalised, whatever you want to call us, are not there to take anyone's jobs. We're here to inspire our future generation. We are here to show them you do have psychological safety in the workplace. We are here to get that for you, right? So we've got to go out and explain that. But the way to also do that is to connect with the faith leaders, mm -hmm. connect with the mandirs, connect with the masjids, connect with the gurdwaras, take your Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, Chinese, indigenous, whatever you want to speak to those faith leaders where you can possibly do a small event, talk to the local community with the mums, the dads, the parents, um, and show them you're trying to change the culture. It's been a long time, but here we are. This is what we're trying to do. Come and join the journey. Abs absolutely. Because ultimately, we need everybody. We do, don't we? We need everyone on this journey because we have so many things within the built environment that we need to fix and we need to fix them quickly. And we can't afford for anyone not to feel that they are welcome or that, that they, because actually it's exactly their opinions that they want. So you talked, you've talked about your role. What I'm also interested is your um, 
to the multicultural chair. So again, for anyone who is listening and they work for an organisation that might not yet have uh, any sort of multicultural network, how did you go about, was it already set up? Have you been part of that journey? Or what does what does your network do? And what advice could you give them? So we've got seven affinity right. groups and seven affinity chairs all have an exec sponsor, right. which is really important. I, I, I knew what I wanted to do when I took over as chair. Three years ago, it was very small. Right. Uh, we were just starting the safe spaces. Um, I was the co-chair and Calvin was there, who was the chair at that time, and he'd done some great work. But when I took over, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> I knew I needed a committee. I needed a committee that was going to be put to work because I can't do it by myself. Yeah. I also knew what I wanted to publish and we, we're, we're going to be the second year in a row publishing the ethnicity pay gap. It's not a legal requirement, but I wanted to do it. The gender pay gap. Um, I work very closely with race equality matters. I helped design this year's challenge. Um, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it this year as well. I wanted to elevate it to keep the con conversation going. And then I wanted to run initiatives that we push through the business, but we do well. And I think that's where we're missing a trick. We're all doing so many initiatives yes. to raise this awareness. And quite honestly, the kind of people we're trying to bring on the journey, and it is us trying to bring the English majority, is to win their hearts and minds. And this doesn't help when you sort of force things down people. Yes. Demographically, the North will be a little bit more resistant th to things. In the South, we're used to being in a multicultural city. It doesn't really phase us. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of more sort of less trust up in the Northern areas at the moment in those communities as right. well. And did you find that from your point of view, it was easy to set it up from an internal point of view, from a membership point of view? Uh, did you have to do anything or was it just, like you said, making those safe spaces, just explaining that you were coming together and then the membership, what grew on its own? Or did you actually have to take positive action to try and encourage people to join? Uh, I, I kind of did it, did the groundwork myself. Right. I phoned quite a lot of people. Um, I also wanted it to be multicultural. So race is about everyone. So yes. it includes the Englishman, includes the Englishwoman um, and have different world-class people that we have there to have their voice as well. It didn't work in the beginning. Uh, it was still me banging the drum, ruffling feathers. And then I think as they've seen me grow in that confidence, they've started to elevate themselves, especially this year for race equality. And I've also helped launch a multicultural senior leadership program so we're nine months into that, and that's for bands from A to D, for people who don't know, bands A and B are usually our frontline staff. Yeah. Bands C and D are our operational and enabling, so they will have a very different sort of um, program set for them. And um, I'm really finding that the quieter ones are really coming out of their shell and it is working for their confidence, their reverse mentoring, their personal branding, um, leadership skills, presentation skills. Uh, they've, they've got sponsors as well and buddies. So that is also help helping raise the profile Absolutely. And can you talk to me about the importance? You mentioned the um, exec board sponsor. Yeah. What role do they play and how important are they in a successive if someone to set up a multicultural network? Uh, well, the, I, I'll go by it just recently. Yeah. I, I didn't even ask for the exec for their support for Race Equality Month, but they've all come out and done their own videos. <laughs> the CEO right. has done his own video of sharing the importance of what we need to do. There was a little bit of disappointment of the lack of engagement from the rest of the business, mm. but that I always say there's silence in data, there's, so we're fine. And I know it's rail, it's a very different, you know, trying to get them on board is gonna be very different, even highways. Um, but there's a plan to push that out into the business so they all do become more inclusive. 
And it's not even just about that. It's, it's to challenge their thinking. So we need more diversity of thinking. Yes. If you are going to grow your business, if you are going to win some work, you need different people around that table. And it doesn't matter who it is. It could be a young person. It could be a grad. It could be the cleaner for your mm. front line. But you need to challenge yourselves if you're going to grow. I, tot I totally agree. And I think that, again, as I said, for me, it's also about at every level, that sponsorship, because people need to know that it matters. And that's as important, whether it's at the top or the bottom, but it's it's encouraging them that action will be taken, not just come along and we'll just talk and then nothing will happen. Absolutely. But there are tangible things they can see. And I'm sure that what you've done in terms of the Race Equality Month, that has helped to show people there are tangible outcomes to this and we really mean it. So let's talk about a bit more about you and your career. So you said that ultimately your, your career has started in more dentistry and has ended up in this fantastic role that you have now. If you were giving yourself advice, um, you know, the younger you, um, and obviously we know it all ends well because you're here in this role and you have purpose and very clear values and passion around what you do. What advice would you give either the younger you or any younger person thinking about a career? What advice as to how you've managed your career? Does that make sense? Or how you've made decisions at certain points? Is there any top tips you'd almost give anybody? Um, I would, uh, there's always this thing about be your authentic self. And I hate that word right. as well, because we all come on with different masks at work. You know, you can come on with the mum mask. You can come on with the work what, you know, mask, the wife, the daughter, whatever. But there is something about our culture to come out and be yourself. At home, our life is very, very different. And... Um, and you know, I really want to get some more girls into the industry. Yes, I really could I do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And trying to, and you know, to be fair, the our backgrounds are doctors, dentists, engineers, and scientists. It's just they don't have the network. They don't know how to get into there. Mm -hmm. And also, if I'm being honest, most of us aren't really allowed to come and work for big English organisations or industries like this. Mm. So there is that fear of how they're going to be looked after and right. what time are they going to come home? Do they have to stay overnight? Or, you know, there is a lot of that. So um, I was having this conversation with Area 10 the other day um, and, and I was thinking, what would I do now if yes. I was coming into this? And if I was... I'm not Muslim, I'm a Punjabi, but if I was a Muslim girl or a Muslim man, I'd want to walk into a depot and make sure that I've got a prayer and well-being room so I can I can change and do all this stuff. So you can't talk about EDI and I and getting all the people in if the facilities aren't even right as well. Um, giving myself the younger advice, I think I would be braver. Right. I would um, raise my hand a bit more in meeting rooms to give that that idea, which is what we don't do. Um, I'm trying to get the multicultural people to elevate themselves in that. Your ideas are fine. You might be the quiet one in the room, but put your hand up. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You... Be more confident. It's. Um, I totally agree. I, I think it's about just putting yourself out there and I think we look at leadership and we're always almost scared of giving that feedback. But actually, all leaders and frankly, anyone in a job needs those people around them that will tell them the truth. Yeah. And in a, con no, but in a constructive way, yeah. because I don't think anyone comes, well, no one comes to work to try to do a bad job or to oh. make a mistake or to make someone feel excluded. So it's something that's happening subconsciously. Yeah. But it's, it's almost how can you create, I think if you're a leader, that environment where you create an, an, an environment where somebody will tell you what you actually need to hear, not what you want to hear, but challenge 
Is that the right thing to do? Why this? And of course, it's about having the right people around you. But it's also then creating an environment where you invite them to say, it's okay to give me feedback. I am going to get things wrong. It's fine. Yeah. Please tell me. I think we need to have that open, honest comms and communication, yes. which is lacking, I yes. think, everywhere. And what I'm noticing is that the, the leadership buy-in is all there. It's fantastic. They want to do the right thing. I think what we're missing is, is that those middle teams where, you know, we work in such a large organisations and industry, so, you know, maybe like the BDs, the ADs bidding, the, that middle layer is the ones that need to be challenged more. They're the ones who need to invite people, embrace that difference. Yeah. It is, because what you all hear in all the research is, is that where, that's why uh, diversity inclusion is so important, because ultimately you make better decisions if, because your lived experience is your lived experience. So as much as you can empathise, unless you invite somebody that has a different uh, lived experience to you, you can empathise with their experience, but you'll never know it. And it's almost saying, please help me, I want to learn. And, and that's the thing, it's being open, I think, to learning, isn't it? And being, you know, willing that your career, you, you know, you, you don't know unless you have the right people around you, I think. So again, just going back to your career, when you've had those big moments to make a decision, do I become the chair of, do I put myself forward or do I go for this role in terms of social inclusion or do I even come into the built environment, which is a decision you had to make? What, how, does, how do you go about doing that? You know, is it, oh God, you're writing a to-do list? Are you writing a pros and cons? Is it complete gut? Is it heart? Is it values? What, what is it for you? So before, I would always go home, talk to family, right. talk to my hubby, uh, procrastinate about it, really. I would. Um, I was never really good at presenting. Well, I didn't think so, anyway. Um, and then think about it a bit more but the reason why I do it is so I can help other people and I can give them the chance give, empower them so I know there's a lot of people that kind of like to dig their heels in for their roles and worry that you know people are going to take their jobs no 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 that's not the case for most of us in this background mm -hmm. yeah we want to be respected rewarded and recognized mm -hmm. but we're literally here to help you and the future generation Absolutely. in our communities. Yeah. Our communities are already doing um, sort of the ESG without anyone sort of telling us to do it. Yeah. There's a lot going on with geopolitics, which is the big elephant in the room for all organizations, yeah. but it's having a massive effect on them for their psychological safety. So they have sort of stopped buying from big places. They're buying from local supermarkets or local, you know, buying fruit and veg locally. Um, and that's where I want to see myself is going to help those local communities and educate them, mm -hmm. educate them a bit more about biodiversity and the importance of climate change and keeping our planet mm -hmm. okay. Most of them, if I'm honest, don't really care about it. Um, so we need to go in and educate them through Gen Alpha the teenagers were kind of lost already so we need to go in younger so then they can teach their families at home and their siblings and whatever it's the so importance true. of everything and it's so true about get speaking uh to younger people about the environment my little son's about to do he's eight and he's about to do a uh, a play um and it's actually it's about penguins and it turns out he's narrator 16 so you can <laughs> and uh, and it's all about climate change but it's about how, you know, for him, that's so relatable to then whether we do our recycling. So, and I think if you can get a, a community young, which is why engagement with community and role modeling, Absolutely. I think, of their, you know, everyone is included and, and presenting that quite visibly, I think, in organizations yes. that that everyone is is welcome and I know a website isn't everything, but the way in which I think it's presented is so important, isn't it? Perception, yes. definitely, really key. I, I read recently that um, candidates are ghosting recruiters. Tell me more. So ghosting usually happens in dating, but ghosting now is happening with recruiters. So if you get an interview and they're selected and they don't turn up, chances are they've had a chat with their friends, heard some not great stuff won't come to the won't come for the interview 
or they've done their research online already. So that is another recruiter's nightmare. Um, but I, I'm more for teaching children about biodiversity as well. Mm. So growing your own food. And that's really big in our communities. Mm. Food is massive for us. So, you know, we grew coriander, mint, potatoes in our back garden. So trying to get the, the young ones mm. to go out for walks, go out and learn about nature, teach their families about growing mm. food again, go to an allotment. And like, like I said, I think it is so important that we keep people engaged, but also with one eye to the future of, look, this is coming our way. There's no planet B. And we've all just experienced a very mild, admittedly wet winter, but it wasn't the, the snowfall that, you know, that sometimes we'd expect. And I think it's those visible differences, but also embracing it, but say, please come and be part of solving this because it's going to take all of our minds together to solve it as opposed to certain people being excluded. So your passion's coming through. If I could give you, I don't know whether I want to give you a, 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 a literally a wand or, or a megaphone or possibly both, but if I could get, you know, the built environment community, the widest sense and also government and to listen to you, what could, what would you love to see that would make more people feel included in our, in our environment, the across the built environment? So I think we need to be more innovative. We need right. to be more forward thinking. Um, we can't keep having the same meetings with the same agenda and the same merry-go-round of people. Yeah. We have to do things a bit differently. I would like them to um, mix up their tables. You know, like the government has a cabinet reshuffle. We need a good old cabinet reshuffle across the board. Um, we need to work on our own in-house social value before we go out yes. and recruit more people or bring them in. So I think there's a bit of housekeeping to do in our businesses, in the industry. We've got really good people. We can upskill, we can yes. transfer them over. So we need to think a bit differently and work a bit differently. Fantastic. So thank you so much for coming in. I love the way that you are so forward thinking, challenging, and I always feel, and I feel like this now actually, that I always love when I spend time with you. But I also think it's so clear what your vision is and the benefits you can see from making our industry truly multicultural. I think, as you've said, it, we're on our way, but there's so many more practical things. And I think there's been so many nuggets in our conversation that if anyone listening to this wants to make their their own organisation, private or public sector, feel more inclusive and diverse. There's been so many practical suggestions you put in there. So thank you so much for coming in and talking to us today. And thank you to you for listening. You can hear other podcasts if you follow Hayes on either Spotify or on YouTube. Mm -hmm.